once folks are in shelter or engaged with outreach, then we, um, you know, we start providing services to them. The goal is um, you know, to have people resolve their homelessness as quick as possible. So we know that about 50% or more, or a little bit more, of folks who actually enter the homeless service system actually resolve their own homelessness, called self-resolving, within two weeks. So when folks are self-resolving, they're using their own strengths to get out of homelessness, you know, we really don't want to get too much in the way of that. So we just make sure that we provide them with the, the level of service that they need in order to be successful, but we're not going to go too in, deep, too in depth with them. If, however, folks are with us for after that two-week period, then we know that there may be some other barriers, so we need to kind of try to work with them to assess those barriers to see how we can um, put these households back in the path to permanent housing. So when we do that, we do a couple of different uh, evaluations. One is called the Vulner Vulnerability Index and also has the Services Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool, or commonly known as the VI SPDAT. And that sort of gives us a sense of some of the barriers that these folks may have, and it kind of gives us the ability to start to try to figure out what type of resource on the housing side may be best suited for those individuals. Is it a light touch? Um, is it a moderate touch, something like a rapid rehousing program? Or moderate touch is more like rapid rehousing, which uh, provides maybe six to nine months or maybe three months of rental assistance with some local support services. Or if the household or individual needs a, a much larger touch of permanent supportive housing, which provides a permanent rent subsidy with ongoing case management support. So by working with these folks, we kind of determine you know, where we are with them. The VI for that is a good start, but it is not the only thing we use. Obviously, we need to work with the individual, the providers, get a good history, uh, what are their barriers, and based on that, we will be able to sort of really determine, you know, who is the most vulnerable, who is most likely, and the goal of the VI for that is to tell us who's most likely to die if you're not providing the account. So that's really the basis of what we do. So based on all that information that we collect, we just put together what's called our mining list. And our by name list is really what helps us determine what housing resources are available and also what housing resources the most vulnerable are going to be able to access. So this is really uh, how um, the new coordinated entry system works. So this way, like I said, is taking the uh, ability to enter housing away from the folks with the, the barriers and really putting it on the system to really look at who are the most vulnerable, how can we house them as quickly as possible. So with that, we really are aligning our resources, we're aligning those services that cost a lot of money to those uh, individuals who have the highest barriers. So we're trying to make that align. In the past, we may have had folks that may not have had high barriers getting very expensive resources. Mm -hmm. So really, that was that misalignment. And then with the old system out as well, when folks did have a lot of high barriers and they weren't able to access the system, these were the folks that ended up homeless for a really, really, really long time. So maybe they were outside for two, three years, four years. Maybe they were in shelters for a similar amount of time. So that is not something that is beneficial to anyone. It's not beneficial to the individual. It's not beneficial to the system. It's not beneficial to the state as a whole. So I think by creating this new coordinated access system, it's really helped us um, use our limited funds uh, as efficiently as possible. Now, that is not to say that we're able to help everyone. And I think that is where the biggest issue here lies. I think we all realize that the state of Connecticut is an expensive state to live. It's not cheap to have housing, and I think over the last 15, 20 years especially, housing prices have really exploded, incomes have not. So we really are on this bubble of, a, of an affordable housing crisis where there are people who, can, who have been able to live independently in the past, and what they really are struggling with is just finding an affordable place to live. And I think that is a struggle that we'll address a little bit in the second panel, but I think it plays a big reality to where we are today. We, I think, have done a pretty good job at marketing the 2 one system and the coordinated entry system for those folks who are homeless um, because that is what HUD wanted us to do. But I think part of the negative of that is I think everybody believes that in order to gain affordable housing, you have to go through the 2 one process. And that's not what that system is designed for. That system literally is designed just for those people who are homeless. And HUD has a very, very specific definition of who they believe is homeless. So we have to uphold to that specific definition too. So when HUD tells us we need to create a coordinated entry system for homeless individuals and families, that is for people who are literally in shelters and for those people who are literally on the street. So unfortunately, if we have households who are extremely rent burdened, who are housing insecure, who are doubled up, this coordinated entry system is not designed to meet their needs at this point. Heck, if somebody dropped us 
50 more million dollars, that'd be awesome. And can we start getting our way down to those more those more housing insecure households? That'd be great. But right now we don't have that funding, so we're just doing what I is pretty much time that's really trying to work to end the the housing crisis for those who are most vulnerable living in shelters on the streets. Um, so that's really how the system is designed. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions after everybody else presents. But with that, I'll turn it over to Rick. Okay, so Rick, um, you are the guy that uh, um, will complain about the post. <laughs> 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 no, you made him the entry door. So, so, so when uh, people call two one one, you're supposed to solve all the problems of the world. Um, so, if uh, you could just speak to first of all um, um, the, the different circumstances that that you encounter and what two one one is really designed. To do and how you do that and then um, uh, what the range of um, other services that you try to connect people with. Uh, Great. Thanks, Marcia. And thanks everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you this morning. And, um, I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to explain. I'll talk up until we get that microphone <laughs> I'll be glad to explain two on one's role in this. Steve did talk about it uh, a little bit, and I'll talk some more about that in some of the services that we provide. Uh, as Steve explained it's designed for a specific purpose, and maybe some of the issues we're talking about that you care most about are not exactly within the definition of how this system was designed. But I hope we can spend some time this morning thinking together about how to address those, those issues. Uh, we, two on one, wants to do the best job we can and to learn from you in the process and do a good thing for me. Their goals were uh, one, to try to divert people away from the need for shelter when, when homelessness was an imminent risk. Two, was to, if, if shelter was necessary, refer people to the right place the first time as much as possible. Three is to save the day. Thank you, Marcia. The third is to, if someone does enter shelter, to try to keep the stay as short as possible. And then fourth is to try to, once a person leaves shelter or a family leaves shelter, to try to prevent them from falling back into homelessness uh, shortly thereafter. That's what the Hearth Act asks us all to do. And some of the kinds of challenges uh, maybe you're the most concerned with require even more participation and, and more resources, we would say. And we can have that conversation more as we, as we go further. So uh, we serve as the front door where part of our responsibility is, Steve talked about diversion activities, that the, 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 the main diversion work happens in the eight coordinated access networks. But we're asked to do what I'll describe as light diversion in two on one. Our, our goal, based on the, you know, the system that's been set up, is to only refer people to the coordinated access networks when there aren't other options at that point for that person or that family. Um, well, I'll say one other thing, Marcia, and then I'll stop. If you have a crisis and you get to define what a crisis is, we don't set that we don't define that. If you have a crisis, you, there's a prompt on the phone when you call 211 which allows you to jump to the front of the line for your housing crisis. You might still wait a while, three and a half minutes, sometimes five minutes, but you don't have to wait 30 or 40 minutes. And I suspect that some of the longest uh, wait times are the result of people who didn't classify their situation as a crisis, and we can talk more about that. Too. So if, if I go on the DEMAS website to try to figure things out, and I, and I hit the thing around housing, I'm going to get Alice's name. So you're right, Marsha, if you were to type in housing or supportive housing, um, our unit would come up. And the unit I work in is support um, the Housing and Homeless Services. And so our target population, as Steve had said, is folks experiencing homelessness. And so we provide outreach services to those folks and the support services for folks who are in permanent supportive housing. 
campus. And then our service providers provide in-home care um, in, um, for folks to maintain their housing. So that's really the, the goal of permanent supportive housing is to help people um, with whatever needs they have to maintain their housing. So it might be um, budgeting, it might be uh, landlord negotiation, it might be um, calling with the person to call 211 to find out are there utility uh, programs that they could be eligible for, um, et cetera. Now on the other side of Demas, not in the housing um, <coughs> world, there are a lot of services that people who are um, experiencing homelessness or, or folks who are um, maybe um, in housing, other, other types of housing, they may be living with friends and family, they may have their own apartment, although very um, expensive to pay for on the, by themselves, they may be in an affordable apartment. And we have um, services that would be, those folks might be eligible for um, to help them uh, maintain their housing, maintain um, their services, um, and help them if they need affordable housing, because as we know, it's very expensive to live in Connecticut. Um, and so for folks who might not be eligible for the supportive housing programs, there are affordable units. It takes a long time to get them. And there are different levels of what we call, so there's supportive housing, which is what we over, what my unit oversees and very specific to persons experiencing homelessness. There's supported apartments where there is maybe no housing subsidy attached, but again, the case management goes to the person's apartment, works with them in the community. Um, if, there, if there's affordability issues, they can work on helping them um, kind of get on affordable housing lists, work maybe with um, getting a roommate or those kinds of things. And then there's supervised apartments, which are also a, a higher level, um, where there is 24-7 case management staff on site, um, um, but the person has their own unit to live in. I, I also want to say, I say this uh, a number of times, while persons in support of housing, they are getting the support services from the housing staff, they may also be eligible for some of these other CSP or ACT programs because their level of skill building need um, can meet the criteria. And so the programs don't need to, to be separated. They can, they can be in both programs concurrently, just getting you know, maybe some support in different ways from each of the programs. After 211 um, says that they can't do the light diversion, um, they usually turn to Journey Home. So Journey Home is the coordinated access system that we have in our region. And, and Matt is overseeing all of that and trying to make all of that work. So um, Matt, I guess what we want to know from you is, so at the ground level of making all of this work, how does that go? Talk about that. Every year we have advocacy to try to get you know, increased resources of housing, um, but it's often the homeless service providers or the case managers who are there, um, whereas we really need a lot more of you to be there with us advocating for um, additional housing resources because that's going to be the game changer um, to make a big difference in, in this work. Greater Hartford, um, we receive about calls to 211 um, from people in Greater Hartford, it's about 400 calls a week um, for people who are in having a housing crisis. And the number of openings in the homeless service system that are accessed through the CAN um, in housing programs per week is about seven on average, um, seven openings per week uh, for you know, trying to meet the needs of the community makes it really, really challenging. Save the day, April 17th at 9 30 a.m. That's the Greater Hartford um, Advocacy Day. We're going to be at the LOB lobbying our legislators. So please, please, please come and speak out and share your story and, and um, talk to our legislators about increasing the resources we need for housing. We meet every week and we have made hundreds of, of changes to the processes and policies for the, the op that run the CAN system. Uh, and we welcome your input to continue to help us to try to improve. Um, one of the things that, that was true before um, the CANN existed was in order to get into programs, sometimes it was based on who you know. You know, if you knew a case manager, if you knew a, you know, a shelter program, a, a CEO of some company of, of, uh, that could help you get your person in or help you to get in, 
but then it might have been easier for you. And um, what was unfair about that was for all of the people, the thousands of people who don't didn't have those connections. And so part of the can was part, part of the creation of the can was also an attempt to try to level the playing field and make it a more fair process for anyone who's trying to get access to these very scarce resources. Again, those seven openings um, per week. Um, homeless outreach, um, anytime they find someone who's sleeping outside, um, they work directly with the shelters to get them through. They will call 211 to try to schedule the camp appointments, but they're not, you know, um, if people are resistant to um, calling 211 because of mental illness, because of any other reason, they're not going to wait and just say, sorry, you know, you can't, you can't, we can't get you in anywhere. They're going to work directly with the shelters to try to get them in as fast as they can um, to the openings in the shelters. Every year, there's seasonal um, overflow capacity warming centers. We try to um, plan as best we can with the existing resources in the community to make sure that um, that when it's really cold outside, that 211 is aware of the local protocols for who they should be referring people to, where they where people should go um, in the community when it's cold, just to, to at least stay warm and survive. Um, not necessarily to get access to all of the housing and programs and resources and everything else, but you know, to, to, to live through the night. Um, the other thing that the CANs do um, that's a key part is for those, um, those very few openings in housing that we have, we, we have a matching process uh, that basically, instead of every agency operating their own wait lists and their own processes, we all come together and talk about all of the people who are experiencing homelessness in the community, um, in the shelter, sleeping outside, and then we decide for those seven openings who is the next top, top priority who's most likely to die first if they continue to remain homeless and how do we um, get people into the types of programs that um, help um, meet their level of needs. All the different programs have different um, uh, levels of services or different length of time that the subsidy can uh, remain. So um, there's a lot of uh, debate and discussion and it's really hard meetings. You know, really hard when some case manager who's there has, you know, 30 clients that they're working with every day and they're fighting to try to get that, that one opening, trying to get their clients into those openings. It's really tough. Um, and uh, not always the easiest um, meetings to facilitate. That's Journey Home's role is facilitating all of these meetings. Um, so we also coordinate the different um, HIV and AIDS um, housing providers, um, the housing for people with HIV or AIDS. And, try to build collaboration among those um, partners, set the same for veterans, uh, the veterans programs, and we have the same kind of processes of matching their openings to the people um, in the community. Um, and then what I think is, what's a really important positive change that's happened um, is once people are matched to these programs, they can, these meetings are holding agencies mutually accountable for making sure that people get into the housing after they've been referred. So it's, you know, it's a clunky bureaucratic processes, there's paperwork and all of these things that have to be done. But, you know, every week we're basically saying, okay, you know, um, to this agency, all right, um, I'll give an example, CRT, you have somebody that's matched your program. What's the status? Where have they been since last week? Have you gotten them housed yet? And then all the agencies in the room are there, and so if CRT says, well, I can't find them, I haven't found them, then the soup kitchen's in the room, and can say, oh, I know where they are, they were in my soup kitchen yesterday, come on over tomorrow, and then we'll, I'll help you get them connected to you to get them into your program. Uh, and so we're holding the agencies accountable every week, making sure that people do get in as fast as they can into housing. Sometimes that's hard, too, finding landlords that are willing to rent to them, with, um, you know, if they have barriers, if they have evictions on the history or criminal background or, you know, other issues. It, it can take a little while to find a landlord who's willing to rent to them. But we also are um, trying to build incentives to landlords to um, drop some of their threshold criteria for not having perfect credit. You know, please take a chance on this person and, and we provide some incentives to them. Um, so if things go bad, you know, they're not going to lose rent. That's their you know, number one priority a lot of times. Um, we also do case conferences after people have been housed. Um, people with complex needs still sometimes um, uh, end up uh, at risk of losing their housing for all different reasons. Um, and so um, whenever that happens, we try to have our partner agencies report that to the CAN so that this entire group of people can use their collective brain power 
to try to make sure that that person stays housed and try to prevent them from entering the homeless system again. That's the worst possible outcome is having them return to homelessness. Um, and so there's a lot of effort at trying to prevent people from falling back into the system after they've been housed. Um, the last thing I'll say um, is that um, we also work with the community care teams in the region, and that um, is the group of hospitals and uh, healthcare providers that are um, working to try to um, solve some complex healthcare needs for people. Um, it's not always people that are homeless, but the majority of the time it is people that are both homeless and having trouble getting the access to the care that they need. Uh, and so, as they can, we're interacting and interfacing with this other group um, on a regular basis um, to try to make sure that people access uh, the care that they need. Uh, so, um, I'll just close in saying one more time, we need you, we need your voices, we need you to be advocates for us. Um, so please, again, come on April 17th, 930 a.m. Sometimes um, people are returning to homelessness and that that is the thing that you don't want to happen. And, and sometimes that's happening because of discrimination. And sometimes that's happening in, in terms of even getting housing is because um, of discrimination. And so Kathy, that's really kind of your role is to step in in that case. So can you talk about what you do to make sure that people are not discriminated against when they're either trying to seek housing or maintain housing? Sure, my name is Kathy Flaherty. I'm the Executive Director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project. And we're a nonprofit legal service agency that serves the entire state and we serve DEMAS eligible clients. So when you talk about the homeless service system, you're talking about a small population of people, especially if you look at the HUD definition of chronic homelessness, small. Our service population is huge because it's all DEMAS or DEMAS eligible clients who are low income and live with a serious mental health condition. And their mental health condition is the reason that they're having the problems that they have. Um, we are part of the legal services system overall. Um, uh, and when I hear the issues of people waiting on the phone to call 211, I think we have some of that same within legal services because anybody who's tried to call statewide legal services of Connecticut um, has those same kind of wait times. And I worked at statewide for 15 years, so I know what it's like being on that side of the phone. Um, the challenge that we have and that I've been engaged in discussions with folks from Partnership for Small Communities, Reaching Home, is I've always felt that now that we're addressing the chronic homelessness, what are we really doing to prevent future homelessness um, or prevent people from falling back into the system? And I think one of the connections that really needs to be made is getting legal services involved in those conversations. Um, having brain power around the room to figure out how do we stop this person from being homeless again is legal services part of that conversation because sometimes there are literally laws that could be used um, to make sure that people either get access to housing or are able to maintain their housing. And if folks don't know what their legal rights are, um, what the landlord's legal obligations are, what the service program's legal obligations are, to accommodate the folks with disabilities who are in their programs, then that is an avenue of advocacy that is being underutilized. But I wanted people to at least have the basics of um, people's rights to reasonable accommodations when they have disabilities. I, there are several laws. There's state law, there's federal law, there's the Fair Housing Act, there's the Americans with Disabilities Act, but the basic premise of all of that is when you're talking about reasonable accommodations is programs landlords have their usual way of doing something if somebody with a disability is seeking a reasonable accommodation that means they're asking to be treated differently sometimes a person with a disability wants to be treated exactly the same as everybody else and that's exactly what should happen because treating them differently just by virtue of them having a disability is discrimination. But the other thing that is discrimination is that if the person with the disability asks to be treated differently because of their disability, the failure to do that is also discrimination. Um, and that's what I think some of the programs don't always recognize is that some of the most challenging folks that we serve and that we work with have disabilities and are entitled to reasonable accommodations. 
the literal problem with that is what is reasonable, and people have very different ideas of what a reasonable accommodation is. Um, there are some things that there is no obligation to reasonably accommodate. If somebody poses a direct threat to themselves or others, there is no obligation to reasonably accommodate that. Um, but short of that, um, there is that obligation to at least have a conversation. Um, so when somebody raises the issue of a disability and says, I need a change in your usual policy, if the response of that program is, no, we don't do anything differently, that in and of itself is a violation of the law. And people need to know that. So if shutdown happens again, um, how does that affect HUD and payments that come through HUD? Um, that affect people's housing. So can we make sure that people don't lose their housing if uh, there's another shutdown? Uh, well, I think it depends on how long the shutdown lasts. Uh, so uh, with this past shutdown, actually, we did okay. Uh, the homeless service funds that we receive are all based on a grant renewal cycle, uh, and we were actually foresightful enough in the past to move any of our grants that started at the beginning of the year to at least April or May. Uh, so we were actually okay in the homeless service world uh, up until that time point. And I know HUD is currently working on making sure that we get our renewals out in this three weeks. I don't know if we'll be able to be completely done, uh, but they certainly are know and are aware of it. I think the bigger issue is the Section 8 program, because uh, that's a much larger issue outside of the homeless service world. Uh, DOH alone has 7,000 uh, Section 8 certificates. Uh, and then if you look at the state, there's probably about 75,000. So I think that's a much bigger issue as always to shut down. Luckily, we had funding in place to March. So I pretty much be, um, uh, believe that HUD will be diligent on uh, making sure they expand our ability to draw funds as far down the road as possible. So we'll at least be able to continue the payments. So we were good this past time. So hopefully, three weeks, they can give us a little bit more uh, ability to draw. I just want to, um, Demas is a recipient of um, federal dollars for the rental assistance program, which is formerly Shelter Plus Care. And so we were lucky also that um, our grants that began in January already had funding available to draw down on, but um, we are uh, granted our money on a rolling basis. So that means, you know, some grants started in April, some will start later in May throughout the year. And so really, um, you know, having the shutdown happen was not that convenient because not all of the money had been um, uploaded into the into the system. But um, I do want to, I don't see anybody from HUD in the room, but I do want to get a shout out to them that they have been working uh, really diligently since the government reopened on Saturday. Um, I was saying to Matt earlier, we got a lot of emails um, on Monday morning when I came to work from the HUD field office that they started to process and get things done so that um, if in the event there is another shutdown, they will hopefully get um, as much done as they can in this in this three-week time to prevent that. So I just want to add in really quickly because this is something clearly that legal services uh, lawyers and advocates around the country have been paying attention to because there are big systems that have been affected by this partial government shutdown. And people have to remember, it's certain agencies don't have budgets. The rest of them do. But the big one that really impacts a lot of the folks we work with are Department of Agriculture, which is the SNAP benefits, and HUD. Um, and there were expiring contracts, so I think even getting beyond the vouchers, you have the project-based Section 8, where um, contracts didn't get renewed for big projects. Bottom line is, if you're working with anybody or if it's you yourself and you get some kind of notice that you don't understand from somebody saying your benefits have stopped or you're getting evicted or anything like that, please reach out to legal services because that's why we're there. So one of the things that you wanted to talk about, I think, was that there are other housing options besides even the housing authorities which have long, long waiting lists. So do you want to mention those as well? Thank you, yes. Uh, obviously the housing authorities around the state do have housing resources, but as we know, you have to apply for a lottery and then hopefully you get on that Section 8 Housing Choice voucher. Some do have availability in uh, the public housing buildings. Those may not necessarily be in the best of shape um, or in the best neighborhoods, but they may have some opportunities. But HUD also has something called the Multifamily Program, in which HUD actually plays private land uh, or private landlords, usually in large properties. They actually pay the operating subsidies. 
So there's something that we can uh, get and pass along to Marshall. It's called the Blue Book. Uh, so that sort of lists out where all of these properties are. Uh, so since HUD is subsidizing them, it may not necessarily be a direct subsidy like a housing choice voucher or a Section 8 might be, uh, but the, um, the household or the apartments will be affordable so they'll be able to at least pay a couple hundred bucks uh, and they'll be able to sustain your rent. So we can get a copy of that um, information out to Marshall to distribute to your grouping. Um, and then obviously we also have partners in the room as I look at Terry Nash here from CHFA that they are constantly um, helping develop affordable housing as is the Department of Housing. Uh, and you know we're putting out units left and right, um, just market rate units as well. Uh, but with that funding also comes a, a stipulation from those developers to provide affordable housing units. Uh, so there's, there is a growing aspect of affordable housing development that was also going on in the state, which we'll also try to discuss a little bit in panel two, about a, uh, as part of the solution. Uh, so we know that there's out there, so if we can get access to some of those units, that gives you guys more opportunities to um, have housing available to those folks who are just simply low income and not necessarily homeless. One of our websites where people can go to learn about the availability of new of vouchers, of vouchers that have become available, whether through a housing authority or some other source. And you can also, on that website, put your name and your email address so that you can be notified automatically if the housing authority in your town or in your region uh, has, a, has an opening uh, in terms of a voucher. Now, the waiting lists are really long. That's a topic that other people up here know much more about than I do, but at least there's a site that you can go to to learn about what's available at a given point in time and put your name on the list where you could at least be notified when something new becomes available. It doesn't guarantee you're going to get it right away, but at least you can be pretty sure that you know what's, what's going on across the state. Let's say you live in Hartford and Mansfield Housing Authority opens up their wait list. You don't have to already be living in Mansfield to apply, but just know that when you're applying, you're usually applying for a spot in a lottery to get on a wait list, so it does not mean that it's gonna be necessarily anytime soon. But the way the Section 8 vouchers work is for the first year, you have to live within the jurisdiction of that housing authority, unless, say, you maybe need a reasonable accommodation to be able to live outside of it because you're hooked up with a lot of providers that are in Hartford that you won't have access to in Mansfield. Those are the kind of things that CLRP helps people with. Um, you know, when you get to the top of the wait list and that's when they finally do the full background check and that's when they decide to turn you down because of either a record um, or an eviction history that's related and you have a clinician who can help tie that to your disability and how the reasonable accommodation helps you get past that. Um, but there are qu a couple of questions around working with sober homes and how this system works with folks that might be in sober homes. Um, and usually there's a time frame um, for um, some of the, uh, the after rehab um, housing and so then how does somebody exit there and get into housing. So could somebody speak to that? Who would best? I, I, can at least, I can at least start because there are two really big clarifications that I want to clarify about sober homes. Sober homes are usually rental housing, which means anybody who lives in a sober home is a tenant which means that person is a tenant with the right to be evicted from the sober home. Even if the sober home has rules that you have to maintain your sobriety to live there, basically what that is, it's a violation of your lease if you, are, if you relapse. And one of the hardest, most difficult things we have, and I will admit there's, there's an argument to be made on both sides, except for the fact that the law is really clear. And the law says that a landlord cannot make a tenant waive their right to summary process, which means that the person's entitled to a warning notice that they violated their lease, and the landlord has to take them to court to get them out. Here's where this really comes up that's a problem for a lot of our folks. If you're relapsing with illegal drugs, how do you fight yourself being illegally locked out of some place? You call the police. Are you likely to call the police if you've relapsed with an illegal substance? No, you're not. So people just agree to leave. And there are a lot of people, honestly, um, some sober home operators are fantastic, but some people are just building very unsafe buildings and slapping up drywall and creating lots of units so they can make money off of people's pain. Um, and so I do think there needs to be something to address it. 
but the reason why you usually see me at the legislative office building testifying against these proposals is that pretty much every proposal that I've seen ever come out violates people's privacy rights, fair housing rights, or other legal rights. Um, if there's a way for somebody to come up with something that doesn't, I'm all on board with that. Um, but I'm thinking maybe Alice. Right, so there are, there are sober homes that I think people just sort of, for lack of a better phrase, put together and kind of call it a sober home. And, uh, and then there are um, certified sober homes that have some DNS oversight, which are, which, uh, are different, you know, differently run. So again, on the DEMAS website, you can go and look, and there are the ones that are DEMAS certified versus um, ones that maybe are not as um, recovery friendly, or um, in some cases, it sounds like running legally, um, perhaps, allegedly. Um, so the other um, thing that I think the question may have been trying to get to was, um, and whoever asked it, if this is helpful, um, if a person is living in a sober home, um, and they had been homeless prior to, that the sober home is not considered a shelter or, so their, their homeless status would change from being homeless to being housed. As, as um, Kathy said, it is, a, it is a legal residence, so then that's why their, their status would change on, the, on a homeless status. I want you to know that if you have questions about working with youth and families, that we'll, we'll talk about that in panel number two, I promise. When somebody has a landlord um, that is not taking care of the property, um, and so they have found housing, but there are roaches and the landlord is unresponsive. What kind of help is there? And that's probably, uh, Kathy, should I start with you? Um, oh, and, and then the issue is that they're not eligible for the homeless system um, because they're in a residence and yet it's not okay. I agree. Um, it's not okay. There are legal requirements for the sort of things that a landlord has the responsibility to do, which is, among other things, uh, deal with pest, you know, pest infestations, um, maintenance of the property, and things like that. But here are the problems with trying to solve that when you're a tenant, is you can complain to your town building code or housing code. They'll come out and inspect. They'll order your landlord to do certain repairs and do those within a certain time frame. And depending on what it is, it may be, you know, you're supposed to do it within 24 hours, maybe you get a month to do it, maybe you get two months. And then you're kind of stuck as a tenant because you have to see if the town is going to actually enforce their own codes. Um, if they don't, the only option you have as a tenant if you decide that you want to do this is a legal action that's called a payment into court action, which requires you making a three-week wait after you've made that complaint to the building or housing code, then filing a case in housing court, and you have to pay your rent on time to the court. And if at any point during the, that process, um, you are a day late you know, after your grace period with the rent, the case is gonna get thrown out of court. What I have found, um, I have found that to not be a particularly effective way to get these problems addressed because people get fed up with continuing to have to pay their rent for a place that's not up to code. Um, or people just run into other problems, the same difficulties they've had paying their rent even if the place was in good condition. And what happens is all that rent the tenant's been paying into court, when the repairs have been made, the court holds another hearing and decides, well, does the landlord get that money or does maybe some of that money go back to the tenant? And way too often, the courts, when even people see these cases through to the end, they give the money to the landlord anyway. So it's just like you're still stuck living in this shoddy place. Um, and even though you're taking all the steps of the legal system to try to address it, it, it just doesn't work. And I think that's part of the biggest problem overall is when you have to relate to using the legal system to resolve your problem, it really turns out the way you want it to. For folks that have um, a subsidy, there is a, a requirement that there's an annual housing quality um, standards inspection done, and so if there are um, issues that are found during that time, and people can call their housing um, person and have one done in, you know, they, they're at least annually, but they can be done in the interim if there are issues that are not being resolved by the landlord. And the housing provider um, can write a letter to the landlord saying, you know, you have X amount of days. Like Kathy said, you know, some of it's 24, 48 hours if it's eminent risk. Um, some of it's, you know, 30 days if it might be like a pest infest infestation. Um, and then the, the housing subsidy can hold their hold their portion of the rent. The, 
tenant still needs to pay their portion, um, but the the housing subsidy can hold the, because um, you know HUD in most cases doesn't want, and I'm sure the Department of Housing doesn't want to pay for an apartment using the state and federal dollars that is not up to code. And so, um, you know, people who have a housing subsidy can really rely on their housing coordinator in some ways to help kind of um, mediate that situation. There are a number of questions around people that have um, either a um, felony um, on their record and so the difficulty with getting housing or um, um, maybe they have um, some addiction history and so that's an issue. So some of those um, people who have, you know, very special needs um, how does the CAN work with them um, to get housing? And is there any kind of targeting for certain vulnerable populations to get housing? Um, so one of the things that we try to do um, is build um, landlord partnerships. And I mentioned it earlier, we try to provide incentives to some landlords to lower their threshold. So if it's a criminal background, um, we would say to a landlord, if you are willing to drop this criteria from denying people for um, your apartments, then uh, we will um, basically um, allow them to um, submit a claim if something goes wrong with this um, apartment. Uh, like if the landlord, I mean, if the client causes damages to the apartment that costs more than the security deposit or more than the insurance, they could then apply um, to Journey Home for a, uh, submit a claim to us for reimbursement for like up to a thousand dollars. And then the same for. Um, uh, um, clients that uh, may have um, other substance abuse issues or a history of that or um, evictions in their history or bad credit or no credit um, will, in exchange for the landlord dropping those criteria, we would uh, provide them the opportunity to be able to submit claims if something goes wrong, including one of the, one of the challenges we sometimes face is people with no income um, that can't access, um, that can't afford to pay their utilities we ask landlords to include all the utilities in the rent, and if they agree to do that, then um, if for some reason this uh, the tenant you know uh, ends up you know overcharging and on heat or some for some reason there's an exorbitant you know utility bill, then we would reimburse the, the landlord for that um, for up to five hundred dollars uh, in, in, a, in a, um, reimbursement for, for whatever that cost was that the landlord's now paying you know that utility to try to prevent. Again, try to build these partnerships in a sustainable way um, and, and make sure that there's no problems that arise. Um, but, um, you know, this is relatively new. Um, we've only had this for about a year now. And, um, and I think ideally we need, you know, a whole statewide um, kind of uh, response uh, that, that somehow um, mirrors this um, effort. Uh, so for the homeless service system, having a criminal background does not preclude you from getting any of our resources, so that is good to know that we certainly will work with anybody regardless of their criminal background. Uh, also, this is uh, an issue that is greater than the homeless service system, and Representative McGee put together a legislative committee called this, uh, chaired by the Center of Equal Opportunity, uh, that really took this issue head on. Uh, so they just finished up their work, and literally last week they made their presentation so you can go on the CEO uh, website and get actually a copy of some of the recommendations. Uh, and I believe that during this session there certainly will be some of those recommendations put forth through the legislature, um, as well as some things that they asked the public housing to do that we probably will take some of it on uh, to make it a little bit easier for folks with criminal backgrounds to gain access to housing. Um, so uh, stay tuned. I just wanted to say one other thing for um, people that have uh, substance abuse issues or criminal background that are applying to the housing authorities or to other um, any of the, the programs, if they get denied, their application gets denied because of that reason, there is an appeal process um, that, that we've been su very successful at helping to get people through, um, um, basically making the case for, you know, yes, this person you know, has a substance abuse issue, um, but they've been through these programs to try to resolve it, or yes, they have a criminal background, but this was a crime that happened you know, years ago. Is there anything, any way you can waive it you know, and, and negotiate with them to try to, try to get them into the unit? And, it, and often, um, it, it has been a successful way of uh, getting people through. And I would just add to that, if the eviction record, criminal record, um, health history record is related to a disability, that's where you bring in the leverage of the reasonable accommodation of a person with a disability. You need the clinician to tie it um, and show that they're currently engaged in services or whatever, 
um, to address what happened in the past, but there is a legal tool. It doesn't just have to be simply uh, convincing or negotiating somebody. You could come with a hammer and just say, you have a legal obligation uh, to reasonably accommodate somebody. And I have heard, and because I've already read, you know, kind of the same way where they're saying, like, kind of ban the box in employment, there is, a, there is at least one proposal to like ban landlords for maybe looking at criminal histories or limiting the look back periods because you know something somebody did 20 years ago is probably not incredibly relevant to their ability to be a good tenant today. So those are the kind of things that we will be sharing information because when people can send in testimony, that is the kind of stuff that makes a difference. Okay, we need to um, wrap up this panel, unfortunately. Um, and I, I promise that we will um, write up the questions and send those out to our panel and you'll be, I'm sure, very responsive in sending answers to me, right, so that we can publish that. Okay. Um, so the topic for our second panel, these are the people that I approached and said, you're the visionaries. <laughs> so we, we want to make sure that we talk about how do we shape the future and the allocation of resources um, to, to make sure that those people who have um, not been able to um, get the help that they feel they need through the, the current system to get, um, to get some of that help and to address some of the gaps and the barriers that they describe to us. Um, what are options for getting more resources? Um, what are current policy um, decisions that we've made that maybe could be revisited? Um, how do we prevent homelessness um, for people that are housing insecure but not literally on the street right now? Um, and what can um, all of the coalitions and advocacy organizations do? And what can we as self-advocates do to help with that process? So we're going to start with Alicia Woodsby. I don't know if anybody remembers, but Alicia used to be on our board um, for many years. Um, she was with KTP, so hopefully everybody remembers her. And Alicia has to leave a little early, so she wanted to make sure you knew that she wasn't being rude, but she has another meeting that she has to get to. And so we'll make sure that uh, she has plenty of time to talk now. Um, we also have Chelsea Ross from the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Um, we have Ken Coranda with Demas. And Steve is on our second panel, too. So he not only deals with the current system, but he has to be a visionary for the Department of Housing. So Alicia, um, in your work at the partnership, you've been at the forefront of much of the policy and advocacy work that has um, um, led to the current system that we have in addressing homelessness as Connecticut. Connecticut. So if you could talk about how that work has evolved, um, how we are dealing with some of the gaps and barriers that people are experiencing. We know that you care about that because we know that you've been working with us for a long time. Um, and then also um, talk about the Governor's Transition Committee and maybe some of the recommendations that are made there that we're hoping um, are going to result in some, some um, different allocation for people that are concerned here. Thank you for having me. Um, as Marcia said, I spent many years working in mental health advocacy, so I'm really happy to be here, and I feel very much at home, and I see a lot of very familiar faces, so. Um, so my work with this issue um, did not start at the partnership. It really started 14 years ago, and looking at the impacts of deinstitutionalization and the fact that we closed two major hospitals, but we didn't, as a state, actually invest in the community-based housing options that were necessary with the service support so that people could live in the community. And so we talked a little bit about that today. It's also, um, my experience is built off of an understanding of the housing crisis that is faced by people with disabilities and the fact that nationally, um, if you're depending on SSI for your income, you have to spend 100% of that in order to afford basic fair market rent for a studio or an efficiency. In Connecticut, it's actually over 100%. So I don't know how we're supposed to figure that out, right? Um, you're supposed to spend more than you have on your rent in order to live in the community, yet we're all expected to figure out a way to live in the community. And so um, these were issues that I'm very passionate about and that really led me to the Partnership for Strong Communities because 
it became very clear to me early on that the answer to so many issues in the mental health community was housing. And we had to have a system of housing that was affordable and that was safe and that had service supports attached to it um, for those who wanted it um, in order to ever solve the issues in the mental health community. Um, and so the Reaching Home campaign um, is the statewide campaign to end homelessness in Connecticut. And I joined that when I was in mental health advocacy and I've been with the campaign ever since. The original goal was to create 10,000 units of supportive housing in 10 years to end the chronic homelessness. And a lot of work was done to do that and we had a very strong partnership. Um, when we, I was in mental health, we strongly partnered with the agency I'm with now. And we worked together to build a very um, robust stock of supportive housing um, across the state. And that was really a huge foundation um, for the progress that's been made on chronic homelessness in the state. We also worked on some really innovative approaches together with, and when I say we, I don't mean the partnership, I mean the Reaching Home campaign, which consists of, we have uh, over 200 partners across 120 organizations, and our major partners are many of the folks that you've heard today, um, that are here today, and others as well. And so together, as a collective um, movement, we have taken on some innovative approaches. One was to match data from the homelessness system with the criminal justice system and try to target folks who were cycling in and out of those systems um, with supportive housing. And that's been called the FUSE program, it's now called CCR, so you may hear those acronyms. Um, but it's really a frequent users approach to trying to target folks who are highly vulnerable, who are cycling in and out of multiple systems. We also figured out how to match Medicaid data with homelessness data and to target folks who were really high need high cost um, Medicaid beneficiaries with supportive housing. And that's called the Social Innovation Fund or the SIF model. And so having the, this work and this foundation, in 2012, the statewide movement um, Reaching Home relaunched. And it launched something called Opening Doors Connecticut. And that vastly expanded the scope of our goals and of our plan to not only be focused on chronic homelessness, but also on veteran homelessness, families with children, youth and young adults, and ultimately all forms of homelessness. And so through that work, um, a tremendous amount of progress was made, as you heard today, about creating a much more, um, really retooling the whole crisis response or homeless response system and making that as well-coordinated and efficient as we possibly could. And I think you know the first several years uh, were spent on that and really figuring out how to do that. And so when I came over the partnership, something that struck me as a mental health advocate was you have to be homeless. You have to not only be homeless, but chronically homeless in order to access these resources. And I don't think I fully appreciated that until I got deeper into the um, homelessness movement to really understand the implications of that. And the reason that it made sense to me from a homelessness movement standpoint was that we had a crisis on our hands and a population of people who were vulnerable and who could die on the streets. Um, and we had a, a broader crisis, housing crisis for people with disabilities. And my hope and my vision around this was that we would get to a place where we really understood how to tackle this where we would have made you know, tremendous progress and hopefully ended chronic homelessness to be able to then utilize resources, build resources, and prevent high need in chronic homelessness from happening in the first place. I don't think I fully appreciated at that time that we would be there already, um, but I think that we are there. I think that we are at a place right now where we have made tremendous progress on chronic homelessness we have a stock of supportive housing for the homeless system, and that we really need to start to get a handle on the data and an understanding of the broader needs for supportive housing of the mental health system. If we're ever truly gonna end homelessness, we have to figure out how to prevent homelessness. And so working across multiple systems is how we're gonna do that. The homeless system's critical, and it, has to function well in order for us to ever achieve our goals, but it's not gonna end homelessness. 
um, it's not, and I repeat this often because um, a mentor of mine, Janice Elliott, gave an analogy one day that has stuck with me where she said, we're not trying to build the best ER. We're trying to, have, to create the best healthcare system. And that is how I think about this issue as well. We need multiple systems in order to create that. Healthcare is not just the ER, right? Just like ending homelessness is not just a crisis response system. Um, so I really do think our progress on chronic homelessness has positioned us to partner in an even stronger way with the mental health community. As I said, I think we need to get our data together on this. We really need to be able to show um, what the scope and the gap is for the mental health system. And some of my colleagues will talk more about ways in which we're looking to do that um, through a supportive housing needs assessment. Um, other things that make this partnership timely is that we're also shifting and thinking about in the homeless system how we might prioritize based on uh, disability instead of by length of time homeless, which is a switch and the orientation and how we've operated for so long. And so we can, Chelsea, I'm sure we'll talk more about that as well. Um, and we're also creating a statewide plan for prevention of high need and chronic homelessness. So you all in, in the mental health system are <coughs> critical in being part of the creation of that plan. And I don't, I think I would be remiss if I didn't know the larger affordable housing crisis. So you have the um, Reaching Home campaign agenda, I believe, um, and those are the areas that all of the stakeholders have come together and said, these are the critical areas of need. If these things don't happen, we're not gonna continue our progress and be able to advance the work to end homelessness in the state. The partnership um, also has, and you'll see on there affordable housing, um, and the partnership also has a whole nother area of work um, around affordable housing as well because we've known for a long time that we're also never going to end homelessness if we don't address the affordable housing crisis. We have over 200,000 people in Connecticut who are spending more than 50% of their income um, on their housing costs. If you're spending more than 30, your, your cost burden. If you're spending more than 50, you're severely cost burden. The vast majority of those households are low income and they are just disproportionately um, people of color. And so some of the things that came out of the governor's transition uh, recommendations that were encouraging um, was this concept of creating a um, statewide housing, comprehensive housing data system that sort of mirrors what we've done with the CAN system, where we can have a way of really understanding housing stock and thinking about what the gaps are, the needs are, and how to prioritize. Uh, affordable housing and so that is something that we are really excited about and interested to see if that if that moves um, they also have recommendations around incentivizing developers and towns to create affordable housing which we believe wholeheartedly in and also have the partnership has an agenda item to create a 20 million dollar um, capital grant fund program that for developers or municipalities that zone for or create affordable housing. And so we're hoping to help advance that and to get more buy-in for that type of approach. As far as the homelessness recommendations that were in the governor's transition plan, they, uh, they adopted the reaching home agenda that you have. So all of those items are actually in the governor transition policy recommendations, which is really significant. Um, to have those there. In addition to that, um, the recommendations call for a commitment from the new governor to ending homelessness, to ending um, homelessness among families with children and music of adults by the end of 2020, um, to finish the job of ending chronic homelessness, and to end all forms of homelessness by the end of his first term. So we're hoping to have the same level of commitment and buy-in that we've had from past administrations. Um, there's a Medicaid item on there that is really important for everyone in this room to think about and understand where um, we're looking to see if the state can adopt an option under Medicaid to cover supportive housing services. Um, if this moves forward, it will greatly expand our ability 
to have services attached to affordable housing units. And we could even do that with existing units um, over time. Um, the transition documents also talk about um, encouraging public housing authorities or incentivizing them to adopt homeless preferences for some of their units, um, to prioritize rental assistance um, program vouchers, um, for RAPs, you may have heard of RAPs, prioritize those um, for people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, the major items for youth homelessness um, on our agenda and in the um, transition recommendations are to preserve the only state-funded program for unaccompanied and runaway homeless youth. It's a, called the Homeless Youth Program. It's at the Department of Housing, and it's $2.3 million. Um, it's not a lot of money. It's critical funding, and so we're hoping to hold on to that. And it has been targeted for cuts. And um, it used to be $2.5 million, now it's $2.3 um, The other is to do a better job at um, identifying students who are experiencing homelessness and doing that by better aligning our state <coughs> statutes with the federal McKinney dental laws that have a lot of protections for students experiencing homelessness. So the recommendation is we have to better um, educate and train the districts around what are students' rights, what are the school district's obligations, and then also what funding is needed to help them to do to comply essentially with that. You asked me to talk a little bit about what people can do. We have um, two days um, every session that are dedicated to advocacy at the LOB. Um, different, the different um, regions uh, come out for different times. So Hartford, as Matt mentioned, uh, Greater Hartford is on the 17th at 9.30. Um, we also have some webinars that are coming up to help folks get prepared for that and to provide tools and training to folks for that. We partner with the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness um, on a lot of these advocacy activities. And so these webinars, um, um, you can go to our website or you could email me. Um, it's www.pschousing.org. Um, you can sign up right on our um, website for um, our newsletter and our information. Um, and I would say, you know, work with us to fight to maintain these resources and let's figure out what we need to start to build a stock um, for the mental health system because, you know, there is a system that is needed, whether it builds upon the CAN system or it is a parallel system that is similarly matching and prioritizing people for supportive housing in the community mental health system so that they don't have to be homeless or go through the homeless system in order to have access to the housing supports um, that they need. So that's my dream, you know, of what would, um, happen in the next three to five years. So when you talk, Chelsea, maybe just talk about what the Corporation for Supportive Housing does, first of all, but but also, you know, we, we want to make sure that people know that there are other resources besides the 211 system, and that you may be thinking about other options for people um, outside of the, um, the CAN system, and so just what what's the direction that the cor Corporation for Supportive Housing is kind of going in order to address some of these issues? So my name is Chelsea Ross. I'm the Associate Director for the Corporation for Supportive Housing, and I work alongside our uh, New England Director on uh, overseeing our training and technical assistance and consulting work uh, mainly in Connecticut, but also across the other five New England states. Uh, the Corporation for Supportive Housing, uh, we're affectionately known as CSH, and we just try to go by that, but then everybody says, well, what is CSH? And so we say, oh, we're also the Corporation for Supportive Housing. So our name gives you a sense of which of the three S types of housing that Alice talked about, supportive, supported, um, and um, supervised, there you go, that we generally focus on, and that is supportive housing. And that's really that traditional model that folks are aware of. We work alongside of um, Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services on looking at um, HUD-funded and state-funded supportive housing, which is affordable housing paired with in-home services um, for folks with high needs. So we do that work across the country in lots of different ways. So we provide training and technical assistance to providers. We work with um, state and local partners on the creation and um, ensuring the quality of existing supportive housing. We spur creation of new supportive housing alongside of our partners, but we also have 
We're a, um, a community development finance institution, so we provide a lot of lending products to actually create supportive housing. Um, and we work alongside our partners on policy and advocacy issues across the state. So we're a um, happy partner in the um, campaign. And um, because of our work, we really focus on how we can maximize the use of the existing supportive housing stock and how we can expand um, the supportive housing stock. Steve did a bit of a good job um, talking about um, some of the other resources in terms of the blue book that HUD puts out that folks can find um, access to. Um, all the different folks that, um, talked about in the first panel around um, public housing authorities that often have wait lists uh, and lotteries for wait lists, uh, wait lists for housing choice vouchers. So the truth of the matter is, right, I think what you're hearing is it's really hard to find resources outside of the CAN. So I think that's... Um, you know, the pit that I get in my stomach anytime folks ask us to talk about um, what available housing resources there are and what are we doing about those folks who aren't experiencing chronic homelessness and are struggling to access housing resources. Because I wish that I could come up and say, oh, you just haven't gone to the, you know, magic website that lists all of those resources and hasn't access, haven't accessed those, because I wish that was the response that I could give. But the truth is that there's a dearth of resources out there for people um, who need just straight affordable housing, never mind affordable housing paired with services. So housing and homeless system, the two-on-one system, I'm focusing on those who are most likely to die on the street. And I think, um, We've gotten used to sort of saying that because that's of course for our business, that's very important to us, but that's a really profound thing to say, um, that we um, we have allowed our system to, to be so um, under-resourced that we have to target our resources to those who are most likely to die. And that we don't ever want someone to have to be in that position or to be on the streets um, or to be that vulnerable in order to get the help that they need. Um, how do we get there? So. One of the things that the Corporation for Supportive Housing is leading currently is the um, process of assessing need for supportive housing across all um, different vulnerable populations. So we have a pretty good sense through the work that's been done around the creation of a binding list that Steve talked about and people who are experiencing chronic homelessness, what the need is for folks who are actively experiencing homelessness, right? We've got, we pretty well understand that and we're working really diligently to align the resources to meet the needs of that population. But how do we then prevent um, folks from entering that situation in the first place. Well, we know that there's all different folks with different vulnerabilities who haven't yet reached the homeless system and that may be better served with affordable housing and supportive housing, or um, affordable housing and support services than in the places that they are served now. And those are mainly crisis and institutional um, in, um, settings. So we know that, Alicia mentioned some of the systems of child welfare, criminal justice, um, hospitals, inpatient hospitalization, whether it's for medical resources, folks who are in nursing homes who may be um, able to live in the community if there were appropriate uh, housing and service resources in place, um, and folks who are in mental health institutions, um, substance use treatment facilities who need a better housing resource um, so that they can be more appropriately served in the community and prevent their entry into homelessness. So uh, the Corporation for Supportive Housing on a national uh, level has done a supportive housing needs assessment across many of these populations. And it looks at what the need is nationally. And it's based on national data sets. And that national data says that in Connecticut, there's a need for about 11,000 units of supportive housing for all those different populations that we think based on that data about 11,000 people who would be much better served in a supportive housing model than in the, the uh, institutions and systems that they're in now. Uh, as a point of reference, there's about um, 5,500 units of supportive housing and our last um, housing inventory count that is submitted to HUD, um, the 2018 count. So across the state, there's about uh, 5,500 units either in a uh, site-based setting or in a scattered site setting across the state. So we're in the process now of looking at local Connecticut data with our partners in all these different systems to take that national 11,000 number and refine it based on local data and what we know about 
point in time population data in all of these different systems. So how many people are in these systems currently? And then how do we think about what uh, their needs are? And most of um, our partner organizations have ways of assessing need. So as an example, the um, Department of Developmental Services has a whole wait list that looks at people who are waiting for um, housing and services that uh, the Department of Developmental Services uh, provides. And they have a pretty substantial wait list, like we have wait lists for housing, of folks that they cannot even currently serve. So like Matt talked about his seven slots for 400 calls, um, many of our partner agencies, the Department of Children and Families, have similar issues of not being able to serve the number of folks that um, they have knocking on their door looking for services. So we're looking at different wait lists, we're looking at populations that these different um, uh, agencies serve to get a sense of what would it take to serve those folks better in the systems that they're currently being served so that they don't um, end up at, um, at Rick's door, right? And we don't end up at all of our doors. So um, 11,000 units seems pretty uh, daunting when you think about the number that we currently have. But that's when you think about the traditional model of supportive housing and it being embedded in the homeless system. So uh, Marcia asked, what can we do to make sure that there's more um, you know, units available? And Alicia mentioned you know, that it really is much bigger than our system, that it's the engagement of these mainstream and sometimes traditional and sometimes non-traditional partners, including uh, child welfare system, criminal justice system, our healthcare system, um, including hospitals and ACOs, um, and bringing them more and more to the table. They're all very active partners in the campaign, but um, in some respects, putting their money where their mouth is, knowing that their resources are extremely limited too, and helping uh, provide housing options for the folks that they serve. Because we know that, um, you know, to Alicia's point, is that so many of these issues um, that folks are facing are remedied by housing. Housing is um, a healthcare intervention. We talk about that at CSH often, that housing is health, it's a basic need. And so in order for folks to have success um, in their lives, they need that stable housing. So how do we encourage these systems to invest in housing um, instead of um, looking to us as a solution to the housing crises of the folks that they're serving? Um, and one example of this that um, the Connecticut Coalition uh, to End Homelessness was really instrumental in putting together um, is a partnership with the Office of Early Childhood um, and their investment of a million dollars in diversion of families experiencing homelessness with children under the age of six. So it's um, a great example of how a department, the Office of Early Childhood, that doesn't have um, you know, a, a, an obvious responsibility for housing, uh, putting resources into ensuring stable housing because they know that if those families with those children have a safe um, place to be, that they'll have better outcomes um, in all the things that they care about as the Office of Early Childhood Education. Alicia talked about some of the, the recommendations from the housing uh, policy uh, transition team, and one of them is the coordination and collection of um, housing resource data into this um, you know, database that would either um, be parallel to the coordinated access system or mirror it in some ways, and I think that is a really important um, step for the state to take because the pathways to affordable housing now are very confusing. I um, started my career as a, a, a homeless outreach worker, but then I spent time doing uh, community case management. And uh, I felt very often that if I were in the position to have to navigate the housing resources or some of the other resources, I would need a case manager. There's no way it took my full-time job of trying to navigate these systems and wait lists and whatnot. Um, to get people the resources that they need. So I think uh, standardizing the access to affordable housing and some transparency about the availability um, is really important, as is uh, you know, getting the data about really what is available and who has access to it. You know, Alicia, I think it was Alicia who mentioned you know, the disproportionate number of people of color who experience homelessness, and so we know more and more that not only is there a disproportionate number of people of color who are experiencing homelessness, but that isn't reflected in the number of people of color who we have in our housing um, 
programs and who receive services. So we know that people are overrepresented in, in homeless, people of color are overrepresented in homelessness and they're underrepresented in housing and services. So we also have to look at not only how are we providing access to different folks with disabilities, but how are we making sure um, that it's also um, racially equitable. I wanted to touch on the idea of uh, focusing on ending homelessness for folks with disabilities as a pivot from the trajectory of ending chronic homelessness. So some of the partner organizations that are here today have just begun engaging in discussions about how to refine the definition of disability and use that as part of an approach that reframes the focus on ending people who have had long um, stays in our shelter systems and are considered chronically homeless to ending homelessness for individuals with disabilities. And that doesn't mean that we don't care about folks who have long stays, but it's an, as we approach um, ending homelessness for folks with long stays, we don't want to have to uh, keep having people come and stay in our shelter system for a long time in order to access resources. So uh, we're in the process of looking at administrative data again to have that data focus of the Homeless Management and Information System, HMIS, and Medicaid data to look at, to get a sense of um, identifying folks who have um, diagnosed disabilities and how can we prioritize those individuals for housing so that we can prevent them from becoming chronically homeless. So that's something that um, folks are beginning to start to talk about to see if we can start um, picking our heads up from ending the, the crisis and putting out the fire um, and thinking uh, more strategically so we don't uh, have a system where we make people uh, be homeless for very long times or um, have to be close to uh, death's door to get the resources um, that they need. Um, we need the voices of people with um, expertise in navigating the system um, and people with lived experience to be in the community development conversations and to be in local um, policy and implementation conversations to make sure that the work that we're doing is reflective of the need and um, and that we're moving in the right direction. So in addition to the you know advocacy days, I think all the work that you're doing is really important and to continue to add your voice um, because that's you know that's what what turns the tide, right? And that's how we, we end up going in different directions. So I think it's really important to hear what um, Chelsea just said is that there are some different thinking patterns that are happening in terms of priorities and um, it's something that Alicia has been waiting for for 14 years, uh, but there are some new things that are on the horizon in terms of um, maybe a different kind of response when somebody um, indicates that they need help. And so um, we need to make sure that our voices are loud um, and, and frequent in terms of um, making sure that they hear from you um, about your circumstances. But I'm hearing a different, I'm hearing a different um, response when I raised some of these concerns than I heard three years ago when the focus really was on the crisis. Um, so I'm just really pleased to hear that. So um, I mentioned when Alice was at the table that um, if you go onto the Venus website and you are concerned about housing and homelessness, you're going to get her. Um, but we also have Kim Granda here who um, it, um, works with statewide services and so there's a lot of populations that she's concerned about. Um, she's concerned about the gridlock that people experience when they're trying to exit one side of our system to another. Um, she worries about um, families with children. Um, so if you could just kind of talk about what, what Venus's vision here is and then as the partner um, that, that um, needs to, to be at the table in, in helping to assess the needs and also to put resources on the table what is Dean is thinking about all of that? Um, so Marsha mentioned that statewide service is kind of an umbrella of services. Um, I have my colleague Alex Minervino here who is overseeing a lot of the work in housing and homeless services. Um, but we also have programs for individuals with acquired brain injury. Um, we work with individuals who are receiving services um, on the mental health waiver. We work very closely with DSS in terms of money follows the person. Uh, we also provide problem gambling services throughout the state. So um, um, as many of you may or may not know, uh, problem gambling very often is a co-occurring disorder um, for individuals. 
We also provide services for women and children, and that is sometimes surprising uh, to people. But at Demas, we have seven residential facilities for women who have substance use disorder where they can enter treatment with their children. Um, this is really quite uh, remarkable for us. Not every state offers that level of care, and oftentimes for women, one of the greatest barriers for them in their recovery is around child care, um, and so uh, that really solves that problem. So we have programs that are located throughout the state um, in every region, and we also, not only in addition to the residential, we have outpatient and intensive outpatient levels of care for those women and their children. Um, the other piece of statewide services has to do with special education, so we're providing services to an individual who is designated as a special education student, and they will receive services when they enter any type of DEMAS uh, inpatient uh, level of care. And while all of us sit in these meetings very frequently, I mean, I see Alicia and Chelsea, and I'm meeting with Chelsea after this meeting, um, we are very fortunate, I see Terry here, we are very fortunate in the Reaching Home campaign that we have many opportunities to convene among ourselves. Um, state partners, um, sister uh, state agencies, interagency councils, uh, we have other um, meetings that we hold with our private nonprofit um, partners. Um, but what we really are trying to do now is to reach out into the community um, to incorporate, I mean, part of what Demas has been doing slowly over time has been integrating the voices of individuals in recovery, individuals with lived experience, um, funding programs for ED recovery coaches. Uh, Demas recently RFP a new program that's called Women's Reach. So we redesigned some of the monies that were going into our women and children's programs and are now going to have 15 uh, recovery navigators that are working with pregnant uh, women and parenting women who are out in the community who might not be connected to care already. And these are going to be individuals located in every region of the state who are not only interfacing with the women in the community, but also interfacing with systems that women interact with, like hospital systems, um, where those women may deliver and confront obstacles and need advocacy around. Um, so the voices of the advocates, and I'm, I'm thinking not only of all of you in the room, but some of the work that Marsha is aware of, that Demas has been a, uh, very much involved in around the Community Wellness and Recovery Coalition, where we're doing work to integrate more peers into our crisis system. We've, we have a very strong voice in the faith community. Um, I see a colleague, um, Angela, from the Greater Hartford Harm Reduction Coalition in the back, where we're, we're working and having community conversations in communities to educate uh, around our crisis system and also to receive input about what's working, what's not working, and what can we do in terms of our next steps. Um, so I, I just think of um, really the importance of um, all of you being able to message out some of the services that we do have available because we, we often confront that issue that oftentimes people don't realize that there are certain sets of services like Alice talked about and other people talked about. Uh, we, want it, we want to spread the word. So we have our website which has a number of resources. I think Demas has an incredibly robust resource, the partnership, CSH, there are lots of tools on those resources, so I would really just encourage um, all of you to take a look at what's out there and also to spread the word um, to people in your communities about being able to access uh, those resources. Some of the collaborations that Demas is doing in particular, because we realize that the housing world is not necessarily an easy world to understand. You've heard about the various definitions this morning, supportive housing, supported housing. We've been working very closely with uh, CCEH, the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness, and because we realize that many of the individuals working in shelters or case managing, managers providing services 
um, to individuals who are homeless or housing unstable would benefit from some of the resources that Demas has. So we've been doing a series of webinars on different topics like women's reproductive health, like ways to engage individuals and de-escalate crisis, um, on motivational interviewing, um, on uh, addressing um, you know, access to services, just a number of topics that people can not only sign into on the day of the webinar, but those webinars are then planted on the CCEH website um, and they're available for later viewing. So that really increases our capacity to get the word out and educate the public. And so I would encourage all of you to also um, to know about that, um, to even check out some of those webinars to give us some input on what you think is helpful or some added topics that you'd like to see incorporated um, in that education. One of the things that we confront particularly is our individuals who are at inpatient levels of care, our women in our residential programs who, because they are considered to be not homeless, are unable to, for example, call 211 unless it's two weeks prior to a discharge. If you think about it from the perspective of an individual, whether it's a woman with a child or a man uh, who's in treatment, thinking about, I can't really call and access this um, potential need for housing until I'm um, two weeks out, could cause some undue stress and harm. So this is one of the things that we've been talking directly about in trying to think about ways to work with individuals earlier on, assess their housing instability, and then look at some of the criteria. And Steve and our partners at CCEH have been very open to those discussions. And I think those are the kinds of discussions that are of the utmost importance and will impact our communities most directly. Um, we've had some conferences, we've had staff from DOH come to our Women's Services Practice Improvement Collaborative. These are all providers of services for women and families in the state of Connecticut in order to hear more about some of the protocols, some of these definitions around what does it mean to access supportive housing, what does it mean to be chronically homeless, literally homeless, housing unstable, so that they have better understandings of the criteria. Not everybody can access HUD resources, but also set so that the DOH liaisons could also hear about some of the obstacles that we have been experiencing on the ground in terms of accessing services. Uh, so it's not only with DOH, one of the agencies that we haven't mentioned today that pertain particularly to families who may be unstably housed or um, experiencing homelessness is DCF. And so all of us work very closely with DCF. Uh, DCF actually has some supportive housing for families um, that's available for clients who are DCF involved. But the way that we're starting to think about it is what can we do so that individuals um, who aren't involved with DCF can begin to access some type of perhaps supportive housing resources. So we're trying to think further upstream, what can we do, number one, in terms of prevention, but number two, how can we begin to universally assess people for housing instability? We had a conference about a year ago. We had multiple members of uh, people you're seeing around the room here from CSH, from DOH, from Yale, um, from uh, Chapin Hall, um, Dr. Farrell, who developed an instrument called the QRAF to really assess um, family housing and stability. And so part of our discussions now moving forward is the importance of assessing that instability early on. Um, a family will get a score from zero to four, and then we're able to really begin to define what level of service they need and how to act on that more quickly. So taking that information uh, from a year ago and thinking about it in terms of the work that we're doing at DEMAS, part of our goal in terms of these recovery uh, case uh, navigators who are gonna be working with women who are pregnant and parenting is to be able to 
talk to them and about housing as well. So it's not only focusing on the woman and her child, accessing medical care, um, and, and you know, working with child welfare, but it's also for those housing navigate, for those perinatal navigators to be able to understand the housing system, because as we've heard, housing is such a critical element um, of everybody's lives. So we wanna make sure that we're educating people and we're educating them in a way that's understandable and that they'll be able to use moving forward. The other piece of the work, when I think about uh, rebalancing efforts, I think many of you know that there's been a lot of work done to get people out of institutional levels of care and placed out into the community um, with appropriate supports around them. Part of those rebalancing efforts have been extremely successful related to Money Follows the Person. And I just want people to know that we have a couple of programs at DEMAS that help to support those rebalancing efforts and help to support individuals who may be currently still in the community um, who may be struggling. So we have a nursing home diversion and transition program. We have five agencies located in the states um, who have nurses who can be deployed out into the community if there is an individual who is struggling. And oftentimes when I say nursing homes, people think about the elderly. Um, it's not only elderly individuals who um, can be in a nursing home. Um, and so I think that's really important to remember. So our nurses, um, and you can call, we have our number right on the website. Um, they are deployable and they can go in an emergency department if there's somebody there who may have had an issue, landed in an emergency room and is really trying to find a path back um, to their home or that nurse needs to make an assessment and decide whether or not there are some other services that the individual could benefit from. They'll do an assessment and create a discharge plan. The nurses therefore will transition people out of higher levels of care. It might be CVH, it might be a hospital, um, it might be a substance use treatment program. So they'll transition them out of there, set up supportive services, and they'll also help for individuals who've been placed in the community and may be at risk of um, going back into an institutional level of care. So we also have a senior outreach and engagement program and that really is geared towards seniors, um, individuals who are uh, 55 and older. Um, and that is really a preventative attempt. So if we have a, a senior who's out in the community and has a substance use issue, uh, we have senior um, outreach and engagement team members from five funded agencies who are regionally based who will go out and work with those seniors in a similar kind of way, providing case management activities they're also interfacing and doing education in senior centers and other areas to let people know about some of the services that seniors can access. So, so that's another thing. Um, the nurses, in terms of the nursing home diversion, are also conducting assessments to really ensure that individuals are not placed in nursing homes um, if they don't need to be there. Um, Medicaid requires a, a two-level type of assessment, um, and those nurses are conducting those assessments. So those are just a couple of things that are happening more on the older adult, long-term services and support side of the house. Um, I wanna bring up one more issue related to, I think, another opportunity for all of us and all of you. Uh, the commissioners of DCF and DEMAS um, co-chair the Alcohol Drug Policy Council, and there are a couple of subcommittees looking at screening and identification, at treatment, at recovery supports, at criminal justice activities. Um, and we do have representation from um, Connecticut AIDS, um, Sean Lang sits on that legislative body. Um, but I've talked to some of my colleagues and I really feel like that is an opportunity for us in housing and through advocacy to, whether it's a separate subcommittee or beginning to express our voices more, um, because we know that the opioid crisis has really impacted people and a number of ways across the board and I think that when we think of housing instability um, many individuals who have vulnerabilities related to their substance use disorder or mental health or co-occurring disorder 
um, need to be served and housing needs to be a topic that's on the table um, when we talk about those things. So one is just a comment, I think, and it, it's, it's, it kind of relates to something that Chelsea said that you know folks are vulnerable. Um, they need warm handoffs and they need caring. And so as we think about how complicated the system is and how um, under-resourced it is, um, when, when people are asking for help, they really need a caring response. Um, and from one place or level of care to the other, they need that warm handoff. So that's, that's really just please remember this. There are a number of people that ask questions about um, specifically people with addiction concerns, and especially people who are saying they don't want help. Um, and, and, you know, there's somebody who cares about them that is trying to convince them to get the help that they need, and sometimes it's the fact that they have children. Um, and so, can you start to talk about the peer support? And I think that's, um, and, and um, Alice talked earlier about the, um, the outreach folks. So, the fact that there is, um, um, help out there um, that that sort of acknowledges the fact that people may be resistant um, is is important to address. So I want to kind of send that, I think, to you first, Kim. Um, but then, um, as well, um, uh, one of the issues that people have raised is that um, can somebody call for somebody? Um, or, you know, can they make that 211 call for them as opposed to does that person have to be on the line? Because um, we, we, we want to we want to help. So um, if you could just kind of address both of those and then we're going to let Steve wrap up with, this is what we're going to do about all of this. I think we're really um, cognizant of this whole issue of individuals wanting help and, and you know, that um, is also relevant in terms of housing. Um, we have, um, and I'm, I'm sure some people are aware of this, we are a housing first state, meaning that, uh, that individuals are, um, able to get housing without completing treatment, without having to go to mental health treatment or substance use treatment, but this is really um, an individual's right. Um, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that there are some individuals who might not want that help. I think what we're trying to do um, is to work harder related to using our partners in um, the community, the advocates, using peers in our work. We are still really contending with stigma related to individuals with mental health and substance use issues, and particularly for me when I work and I go to visit programs and I hear people telling me, you know, I'm still being treated differently, and if I'm a pregnant, you know, pregnant woman who, you know, that's like three strikes against them. You know, you have a substance use issue, uh, uh, mental health issue, you're pregnant and you're still using, how dare you? Um, so we need to change that. We need to be able to, um, like Marcia said, really be able to extend out to people with care and respect. Um, and we also need to be able to look at the dignity of risk. I mean, that's the other thing that I think is really important. There are some times that um, we, we need to just listen to what people are telling us. Um, so while we use our warm handoffs, while we try to create a system um, that is using more of our community-based resources, the faith-based community, to work with us in crisis or on other issues, our advocates, the regional um, behavioral health um, organizations, we also need to acknowledge that it may take longer for some people. Um, we can still continue to be respectful and engage with them um, along the way. Besides giving us sort of a, a wrap up um, from the DOH perspective, there are a number of questions that people asked about um, developing options. So for example, um, buildings in Hartford that maybe you know could use some conversion, nursing homes that are closed down, um, incentivizing developers, um, and so I don't know if, if part of what you talk about in terms of your vision could be to look at some of those development options um, as well as just, you know, what, what does DOH want to do with all of the transition recommendations that uh, have come, are coming your way? Uh, so I can speak a little bit about the development. That isn't necessarily my expertise. That's the other side of the shop. 
But uh, under the previous administration, there was uh, a lot of money that went into uh, developing affordable housing, over a billion dollars in the Governor Moore's term. That has produced almost 10,000 units of affordable housing. But we're still here. We're still having the same conversation. So it has made an effect, but has not ended our situation. So we need to continue to commit to that. Um, obviously, I would love that, but that's not my decision. Uh, that's up to you know the legislation of the governor to put forth the bond funds to do it. And obviously, in a tough economic situation, we, I don't know what direction it's going to go. Uh, but building affordable housing is certainly the key. Uh, there are a lot of developers out there that are interested. I know, like I already mentioned, Terry, uh, they will have their funding either way because um, that isn't state related. So there will certainly be opportunities on, uh, to, develop, to develop affordable housing through the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. So we need to continue to push that along and ensure that these units are affordable to the populations that we serve. Um, so nursing homes are a little bit more difficult. Uh, I would love to reuse them, uh, but there are a lot of issues related to nursing homes, especially as it relates to who holds the mortgage on that and what happens to that mortgage. Uh, usually HUD has uh, financed it at some point and they have some money left on it. So nursing homes to redevelop would be a great idea, but there are some real difficult hurdles where I think there are some other properties around our communities that will be much more easily developed. But we are thinking about nursing homes too. Now, housing I think you see here is such a big issue and it, and it really is a social determinant. We know that when we put somebody in stable housing, a lot of things get better. Uh, Alicia mentioned our fees program for the criminal justice folks. You know, our recidivism rate in that program is between 10 and 15 percent. The regular recidivism for DOC is 50 percent. So you can see what housing does. It provides a stable base. It provides a place for people to get the services and, and the care that they need so that some of these negative factors do not happen again. So those of you who know me know I'm like this big picture thinker. So when I have a vision, I think it's pretty big and pretty bold. And this is what I would like to see. I don't know if it's possible, but if we don't try, we're not gonna get anywhere. So think about this person. Think about a, a mom uh, with a kid under the age of six with a mental health or a substance abuse disorder who was a veteran who has been homeless is receiving SNAP benefits. Is at risk of uh, having her child take away from DCF um, who wants to get a job but has lacks transportation to get that job or maybe would like to get uh, into a higher ed and who has a criminal justice history. So now how many state agencies did I just mention? 10, 12? This, right, this is one person. So we're all here talking about housing, but I'm talking about this one person and we as a state need to come together. We need to have our commissioners discuss this because this one person has the same problem. They have a housing problem. They have all these other issues too, but without that housing, without that base, it's gonna be difficult to be able to deal with DCF. It's gonna be difficult to be able to get a job. It's gonna be difficult to be able to ensure your stability with mental health or substance abuse if you don't have a place to live. Your chances for trauma increases dramatically if you don't have a place to live. So we are always talking about siloed services because each of our state agencies are really good at that because that is our expertise. So one thing I would love to see DOH take on with our small staff of 34 people with our commissioner <laughs> is to think about how we can be the glue. How can we be the ones that really tries to pull together these different state agencies together? Um, because these are your clients for all your state agencies and they need housing. So how can we get there? I think one way to get there is to have you guys do what you're doing. You need to push on your agency that you work with to say that housing is an issue. Bring them into the table, have them at these discussions. You know, I go to all these meetings, I see that everybody says, well, housing is an issue, what can you do for me? I'm like, well, how can I turn that around on you? What can you do for me? Yeah, we have housing resources, but why don't we look at all of the different programs that we are administering throughout the state? Are they all effective? One thing we've certainly done at DOH is we, we've only been around for five years, six in July. We actually took a look at all of our services and we rebid everything. So we really made some tough choices. We actually defunded people. You know, just because somebody was getting state services for 30, 40 years doesn't mean that they should automatically be continued to get them. Because we want to make sure that we have a limited resource. We need to use that money as effectively and efficiently as possible to serve those who are most needed. 
So I would love to have my state partners do the same and say, you know what, yeah, maybe we've been funding this program for 42 years, but you know what, the outcomes are poor. We're not getting anything for our money, so why don't we look at doing an innovative housing program that we tie with our support services to do it to be better and improve. So is that a vision? That's a vision. It's a big vision. It's not gonna be easy to do, but that's why we need to have these conversations and we need to keep bringing the topic of housing up all over the place, because without it, if it's just you guys talking to me, great, then maybe I can do a housing program specifically for uh, somebody leaving CDH or somebody in a group home, because I think that's a great idea, because it creates flow throughout the system. But then I have the criminal justice saying the same thing, then I have you know, the vet saying, I have all these people saying the same thing to me. So we can't do this, or I can't do this, or DOH can't do this alone, we need to have all of our state partners integrated. Yep. So how do we break down those silos? How do we work together? So that's my thing. I think what was really um, transformative in this last campaign related to family homelessness is that um, via just the participation of the people um, in that work group, a family and children's work group that was co-chaired by Tanya Barrett from the United Way and Kim Sommer Rodriguez from DCF, is we began to actually count the number of children who were homeless. That had not been done before. That's kind of shocking. Um, so we were able to actually not only count the children, but begin to look at how old those children were. It turned out we have over 150 kids from two years old and under, 150 kids between the ages of three and six. I mean, so when you start thinking about that, that gives us information as well, like Steve is saying, and where do we need strategically to direct those resources? We need to really be mindful around childcare, around employment training, around you know issues for moms around transportation. Um, in the opioid crisis, we have infants now, it's wonderful that moms are getting medication-assisted treatment, but their infants can also have neonatal abstinence syndrome, and so that creates other vulnerabilities. We know that being a homeless infant or a homeless young child is a predictor for future homelessness. So this data is crucial for us as we move forward. And, and that's, um, that's something, you know, I know Steve and all of us sitting at the table are, are very, very passionate about. We just see the extraordinary amount of information that this is beginning to show us. The Connecticut CAN data website and other resources where we're able to see things in real time. I mean, that is powerful. And for many years, we've been asking our providers to give us data, um, but we haven't really explained it well. And, and so now, you know, through our partnerships across the board, we're not only asking for the data, we're looking for the quality of the data and we're feeding it back to people so that they don't see it as this futile exercise and just what am I doing this for? It, it makes a difference. It's making a difference in people's lives in the way that we can direct resources. So I know I didn't get to all of your questions, but as I said before, we will type all of those up. We will send those to our panel members. Um, can we just have a big shout out for our panel? A couple promises that I will make besides the fact that we will type up all the questions and get those answers. Um, uh, somebody mentioned webinars. Um, so um, I, actually there's one tomorrow, I think, um, that CCEH is doing, and um, it's already on our newsletter. Um, I will publish all of, those, all of those advocacy opportunities. I will publish all of those webinar opportunities. Um, you know, we started this whole discussion with a decision to review supportive housing services as our annual review this year. And the more we are diving into that, the more we are realizing what a big issue that is. And so that's part of the reason why we decided to have this forum. So um, there's a bunch of you that um, are on our catchment area councils that we've asked to be a part of that process. So if you want to be a part of a review, um, Quinn is organizing those reviews um, um, as we speak. And so we need you to volunteer. We need you to show up at some of these advocacy events. We need you to start educating yourselves about um, through some of these webinars. We need you. Um, they're all saying they need you. They're listening. I'm hearing a different level of listening um, now than I've ever heard before. So it's 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 the time to speak. Um, did I miss anything? Hello. 
Did I miss anything, Quinn? When's our legislative breakfast? Our legislative breakfast is March 19th. Um, housing will certainly be a topic there. Um, please come. Make sure your legislators come. Uh, um, Larry, I think, is the only municipal official who came today. Is that right? Did anybody else come um, as, a, as a council person? Another council person came? Thank you for coming. Yes, <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming. This is uh, a <laughs>